Hello there, and welcome to Talking Nerdy, the show where we take various events and story arcs from current comics, and we cover them. I'm your host, Obi-Wan Jabroni. Now, today's story, we have X-Force number 22 through 25, written by Benjamin Percy, with art by Robert Gill, and colors by Guru EFX. Sage has caught wind of several instances of what looks to be telephoronic control of various human hosts, and discovered similarities to the Weapon Plus subject manslaughter. Before its ta- <clears throat> X-Force is tasked with finding and questioning manslaughter before it is too late. So, with that, let's start talking nerdy. Leading us to our first issue, X-Force number 22. Now, we open up one month ago in Alabama, and we see Dr. Bloodroot visiting a grave when he is interrupted by the leader of Zeno. And we learn that Bloodroot's wife has died from an overdose on Krakoan medicine, and Zeno is trying to recruit him to help take down the mutants. And we switch to now at the X-Force base on Krakoa. Sage and Beast are getting over various video, going over various video feeds and files about Xenospores being hid in various places in public and infecting citizens. They turn and we see the Weapon Plus victim, Manslaughter, sitting in the room with them. Manslaughter says that the people are being controlled by the spore and he is... <clears throat> but he is a unique host and has control of himself. <clears throat> oh, my page is stuck. I'm sorry. Control of himself. Beast says, let's test that theory and chop off, chops off four of Manslaughter's fingers. They fall to the floor and grow into smaller sized Manslaughter's, as Beast says. Fascinating. You're not, a Sage implied, alone. Not exactly. You can grow outward, extend your roots and seeds and networks, similar, similar to the rosematic tendencies of certain trees. You are the parent plant of these fingerlings, and so you control them. <clears throat> Manslaughter says that before he goes, he wants to talk to the host, Krakoa himself. And at this point, we switch to New Orleans. We see some of the Order of Ex-Human Cultists worshipping a Krakoan gate when Dr. Bloodroot approaches and tells them they are pathetic and should not and should worship him now, not these false gods, the mutants. Vines explode from his body as he transforms into a plant creature. Vines go down all the throats, all of the cultists' throats, and he takes control of them as he says, I am no mutant. In fact, I hate what you love. But all the things that supposedly make them special, their plant-based medicines and seeding gates, I speak the same Floronic language, and I'm commanding you, worship me now, my little weeds. I'm the pollen, so, uh, I'm the pollen soaring your nose and blinding your eyes. I'm the fungus growing in your groin and between your toes. I'm the dirt you choke on in the grave. And if... And I say, if you want a piece of Krakoa, go on. It's yours to take. <clears throat> and he connects with the Krakoan gate and lets all of the cultists through and onto the island of Krakoa itself. Now, elsewhere, <clears throat> sorry, elsewhere in front of Krakoa's tree itself, Wolverine, Domino, Wolverine and Domino join Beast in manslaughter, and Beast says, <clears throat> You are X-Force's principal field agents, aren't you? Well, this is the field. Our friend here hasn't decided if he's going to work with us. Kudzu was introduced to America as an ornamental in 1876. It grows a foot a day and swiftly overcompetes native plants. Within years, it becomes dominant in the South and Midwest and led to species existence, extinction. We need to address how to deal with this invasive species that seeks, <clears throat> seems to intend to choke us out. Together, they'll access what I guess you could call a floronic network, unavailable to the rest of us. Roots, macorons, spores, pollen, wild grass and ditches, flowers and tree leaves, 
potted plants on window sills, all of it. Together, they hope to find the source. <clears throat> and at that moment, on various parts of the island, cultists appear and start to attack all of the mutants. Meanwhile, Wolverine, Domino, and Manslaughter approach Dr. Bloodroot at his wife's grave. Manslaughter calls him out for making him a monster, and Bloodroot turns into a plant creature. He di <clears throat> dives his hands into the ground and creates plant minions out of the nearby corpses and other graves. As they fight, Sage calls to them and tells them to kill the host immediately because the minions are attacking the island. Bloodroot dies at Manslaughter, who shifts to the side and stabs him in the chest and absorbs the plant matter. He throws him to the side, and Bloodroot shakes and withers down to bone. As he does, all the minions on the island <clears throat> and at the gra graveyard fall over dead, ending this issue. Taking us to X-Force number 23. Now, we open in Siberia, and Mikhail Rasputin is standing and watching a train approach, and it stops, and the leader of Zeno gets out. They greet each other, and then an army of strange-skinned uh, strange soldiers step out of the train, and Mikhail says that Zeno is short on his count. When they are interrupted by an ice bear attacking... Zeno tells the new army to attack, and as they do, he says, This is actually a good opportunity to demonstrate the equipment. Observe my handiwork. The detachable hand can serve as the king of flail and grip hook. Then there are switchblade bones sleeved into the arms and legs. <clears throat> no rush, as you'll soon see. The fallen soldiers is still in this fight. Wait for it. When the bear took the bite out of him, and in the, uh, it invited a nesting doll into its stomach. Are you impressed? You should be. Homo superior is an irrelevant accident compared to the intentional evolution I can encourage. Did I mention their eyeballs are also now detachable to employ as surveillance devices? And at this point, we switch to Beast's lab. And he is dis dissecting a miniature skin soldier and saying... I couldn't help myself. When the island was <clears throat> breached by the Russian nesting dolls, everyone insisted on burning the remains, but I secretly harvested a single specimen and kept it on ice. How could I not? They are walking biological weapons, biological Swiss army knives even, and I find myself fond of them. Who among us, after all, doesn't keep dangerous secrets tucked away inside themselves? <clears throat> What if I were the nesting doll? If you cracked my rib cage and shoved aside my organ, what horrors would leap out of me? It was Goetha who spoke for all of us when he said, There is no crime of which I do not deem myself capable. Have I deemed, <clears throat> have I dreamed of human, human annihilation? Yes, of course. Given all they've done to mutants, it's a reasonable fantasy. Did I imagine briefly after Xavier died, taking his place as the father of Krakoa? Surely I am not the only one. In the dark places, fantasies go wild. There's nothing harmful about that. It's healthy. In fact, to acknowledge. To study and dissect our impulses is to tame them. <clears throat> and another skin soldier bursts from the dead one's chest as he cuts it open. He loses sight of it immediately, and it climbs up his fur and into his ear, and Beast falls to his knees, screaming in pain. Now, back in Siberia, Mikhail and Zeno are walking through Mikhail's base, and Mikhail says, We should go inside. One of their satellites will be passing over soon. Of course, I mean Krakoa. Moscow embraces us. The mutant nation grows inside Mother Russia. It's like flavored children. Like a favored child. Sorry. As that is why we are the superior vision of what the world could be, human and mutant. The Krokoans are selfish, sypophenic, xenophobic, capitalistic. The Russian mutants, on the other hand, are communistic in their role. We work in service to country for our benefit of all. Each and every one of us is a worker, workers with different tools at their disposal. The pale girl carries a hammer in her head, cyber 
carries a sickle in his hands. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Cyber carries a sickle in his hands. And Mikael turns and snaps his fingers. And they both get transported to a completely dark space with nothing around them but themselves. And Zeno goes, what have you done? Where are we? We are nowhere. Ask the man with no face and no name. You could think of this pocket dimension as your own personal gulag. You come here with your faction of what you promised. You make a mockery of my country, and I see sense that you are always one decision away from turning on me, comrade. I will leave you alone here with your thoughts. And Mikael leaves him in this dark, voided place with nothing but himself. And we switch back to Beast's lab, and Beast is recovering from his pain and starts running tests on himself, as he says. I died once already. I didn't, don't plan on repeating that experience. It was just the discomfort. It was the anxiety that something had been lost or that someone might try to change me upon my rebirth. Often I hear from others, I miss the old beast, the fun one, the cheerful one, bounding and playful as a kitten. Maybe he is still hidden away inside me. Certainly he's hidden away somewhere on Cerebro, but his time has passed. If we're going to survive, we need a bastard in charge, and I'm that bastard. <clears throat> I can feel the, the parasite, a twinge in my elbow, a flutter behind my eyes, star burst of pain in my gut. I don't know what it <clears throat> what its plan is to kill me or burrow into me like a tick and suck out information, but I will extinguish it. <clears throat> and he rushes to Sage's office and tells her to quickly call Black Tom Cassidy. And Tom gets called and meets Beast in what he calls the Shadow Room. Now, we learn that the Shadow Room allows Beast to visually see inside his own body via 3D imaging that takes up the entire room itself, kind of like the danger room. And Beast tells Tom that he needs to make a miniature version of himself and go inside of Beast's body and get rid of the, so stone, ugh, the skinned soldier. Tom quickly makes a little wee Tom and sends him in the Beast's ear. And that ends this issue. Leading us to X-Force number 24. Now, we open up inside of Beast. And Wee Tom is walking through Beast's body and catches a glimpse of the skin soldier. And he takes off after it. He catches up to the soldier who slices the vein as he runs away, spraying Wee Tom with blood. Wee Tom lunges at the soldier and impales him to, and throws him to the ground. But three more, even smaller skin soldiers burst from the chest wound and start to run off. They dive into a hole and Wee Tom follows, but he pushes, <clears throat> passes them hanging. Sorry, they dive into a hole and Wee Tom follows, but he passes them up as they hang on the walls and Tom continues to fall and lands inside Beast's stomach. Now, we switch to the Savage Land at this point. And we see Colossus doing farm work, and he is approached by his girlfriend, Kayla. She tells him that she is going to make lunch, and she goes to their house. A bit later, Colossus goes to the house to join her, and we start to get a dual scene of Colossus and a mutant who can manipulate writing via, well, reality via writing. And we learn that Mikael is making the mutant mess with Colossus' life. The mutant sits down and starts to write. <clears throat> in the savage land, the sun sank and left behind a red-purple bruise on the horizon. Only then, under the shroud of night, did Pichor return home. This was his favorite moment of every day. When he had finished with his good work, his muscles pleasantly spent. Their air cooled, the fire lit. The smell of the smoked meat and grilled vegetables spiced the air. She would be waiting for him. She would, <clears throat> so would a bath. His books, his paints, his easels, a bottle of vodka, vodka kept cool in their root cellar. But instead of a smile and a kiss, he was greeted with the sound of crying, a low moaning that comes from the deepest pain. He calls out her name, Kayla, and approaches her bedroom door. He didn't have to ask her what was wrong. At a glance, he knew. <clears throat> this is not what you think, he said. 
Her voice rose to a shriek. You can't. You can't explain this away. Let me try, he said. He handed out his arms, motioning for her to come to him. She had always felt safe there. She could not resist. She wanted to believe in her gentle, kind, good Pitor. He whispered that it would be all right, but he was lying, of course. Nothing would ever be right again. <clears throat> and Colossus embraces Kayla and looks down at the paintings, showing that the mutant's greatest secret resurrections. And he squeezes her harder and crushes Kayla to her death. Mikael raises his drink to his little brother's story and laughs. Now, back in the shadow room, <clears throat> Beast forces himself to vomit and puke Wee Tom and all three skin soldiers out of his body. Tom quickly throws a blue flame onto the vomit pile and roasts all of it and them to ashes. Tom helps Beast to his lab and sits him down. Beast looks up and freaks out as he sees a tiny skin soldier on Tom's face. He grabs a knife and realizes that it followed his gaze and it was inside of his own eye. He plunges the knife into his eye and rips it out, throwing it to the ground and proceeding to stomp on it. He pants and looks up at Tom with blood running down his face and says, Krakoa is finally safe now. Now, back at the Savage Land, Colossus waits until dark and takes Kayla's body out to the flower garden and buries her where no one will look, to, out, look or find her. He goes back home and bathes, and as he gets dressed, he gets a knock on his door. He answers and sees Professor X, asking if they can talk. And that ends this issue. Taking us to our final issue, X-Force number 25. Now, we open at Forge's lab, and Wolverine and Forge are talking, and we learn that Forge has been making Wolverine a special surfboard made from a specific Krakoan metal and with adamantium fins. Forge gives it to him, and Logan says that it's perfect. He leaves and takes it to Dead Mutant Cove elsewhere on the island, and we get an internal monologue. <clears throat> when some people think of their island life, their mind goes to pulling fruit off trees, lounging on white sand, beaches, and raising a tiki mug and a toast. But from the beginning, the place no one goes on Krakoa is the place I love most. The waves here will scrape a cloud's belly. 50 footers, 70 footer, 100 footers, millions of water, <clears throat> a liquid avalanche that will never stop. When you drop the air, when they drop, the air and earth shake. It is violence that you find true paradise. You do your best living when you can taste the dying. <clears throat> and we switch to elsewhere on the island. And the Stepford Cuckoos are lying on the ground and watching the sky when Kid Omega approaches and Phoebe gets up and they go off to the bower together. They go in and together start to scan and soothe all of the babies. And we learn that Omega does this once a week to help control and identify mutant powers and to just do some good in this world. Now, back at Dead Mutant Cove. <clears throat> Logan's internal monologue continues. <clears throat> this isn't where you go to swim and play. The waves will mangle you, or the reef will chew you up, or the current will rip you out into open water. You can't even sunbathe here. The pounding and slapping of the waves makes the air shake. I asked Sage to do some math for me. A 70-foot wave can do 500 tons of damage to a body. Welcome to the Thresher. There's no better feeling in the world. Beast <clears throat> beats the best sex or whiskey buzz you'll ever chase. It's like wrestling with a mountain or boxing the sun. An elemental battle, a defiance of nature. The wave always wins. At best, you merely hang on for a bomb blast of a rod. And at worst, you're reminded of what you should already know. We're all bits of meats getting ground up in the jaws of the universe. <clears throat> and Logan crashes and gets beat the hell on the rocks for a moment before he is pulled out of the water and drugged to the shore by a blonde woman. She tells him he's heavy and that her friends, her and her friends barely got him out. She says her and her friends like to ride hell as well and invite him to join them. 
he agrees, and we get a scene of Logan and three others, the blonde woman and her two friends, out surfing some more on the same waves. <clears throat> and we get more internal monologue. Next few hours, we surfed until our lower backs cramped and our thighs and ankles trembled. They told me about other places they surfed outside of Krakoa, the pipelines of Oa, the super tubes of South Africa, the Pea Pass of Micronesia. The best waves were also the most dangerous because of sharks, reefs, gun-toting militias, ice-churned waters, whatever it is. They say they got their eyes on Alaska. A coastline volcano is about to blow and the hot cold mix will create a perfect storm for perfect waves. There are so many mutants now, thousands more. But this one, she gives me this feeling, a little like what a bullet must feel like when it's shot from a barrel. Sometimes you fall hard and fast for somebody. Her name is Pike. <clears throat> and we switch to elsewhere on the island at Kid Omega's home. Omega is awakened by a psychic call from Phoebe, and he sends out his astral form and goes to the woods to join with Phoebe's astral form. She tells him to be quiet and listen, and says, <clears throat> We need to talk. I peeked inside your head when we were at the nursery. <clears throat> I know, I'm sorry, but sometimes your mind is so loud and electric, it's like the Las Vegas Strip. It scared me. It's just too much. You want to know? You want to know? You, know, you want too much. You love too much. You're too much in every way, an omega through and through. I just need some space, physically, mentally, a break. I'm sorry, Quentin, but my greatest commitment will always be to my sisters. And we see a projection of the two of them with a baby of their own as Phoebe floats away, leaving Omega alone in the woods. And meanwhile, back at the bower that night, we see Pike and her friends quietly stealing three babies and putting them into backpack tubes. They run out and escape into the ocean and swim away from the island stealthily. At this point, Black Tom calls Sage on the comm, saying, <clears throat> Sage, this is Black Tom. Maybe it's nothing, but maybe it's something. The veg is giving me a tickle, telling me that two things that up up add up to a bit of bad business. First, there's the Bauer bassinets. Then there's the plankton perimeter. Need to investigate further. But if we were putting down a wager, we'd say there's a bloody baby heist underway. And that ends these issues. I hope you enjoyed this week's video. Join us next week as we cover Avengers number 46 through 49, World War She-Hulk. Thanks for watching. As always, remember to like, subscribe, and share our video to help spread our brand through the world. Also, leave a comment down below. Feedback is always welcome. You can also follow us outside of YouTube on the Jabroni Nerd Network Facebook page. So, with that, until next week, guys, keep talking nerdy.